Vicki, thank you so much. That was wonderful. What a wonderful way to bring in the Christmas season with these nice songs we're having each Sunday. I'll tell you what, really killer. And Solomon, thank you so much. I was listening to Solomon, not just as he played, but as he sang along with it. And I was thinking to myself, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like Solomon. I mean, he gets to sing with all the good people. I mean, all the really good people. He gets to be back there, and he gets to sing with them. He gets to just kind of, everyone's listening to him play, but they're not realizing that he gets to open his, and if I were singing with them, people would think, oh, Eric, get off the stage. That's awful. You know, but it's just such a blessing, and I think what a gift, and what a gift it is to come to Christmas. Merry Christmas. I hope you're taking the time to enjoy the Christmas season. I dug through three closets this morning to find this sweater, just so I could have something red to kind of make my mind in the Christmas season. I've been making an effort, and you know, last week I talked about, you know, how to get in the Christmas season, and I talked about red lipstick and red fingernails. I wasn't going to do that this morning. Way to go, Ellen. I love it. Way to go, Terry. Some of you actually went out and did Ken? No, no red lipstick, no red fingernails for you. But I thought about what a blessing. It is just to be able to start kicking ourselves in the seat of the pants to get there. Because no one else is going to make this happen for you. No one else is going to bring about the Christmas season for you. No one else is going to embrace the Christ child for you. No one else is going to make the celebration happen for you. And if you don't do it, what's going to happen is you're just going to kind of miss it. It's going to go right by, and this is what you're going to say. You've said it before. I've said it before. Someone came in to me just this morning and said to me something that's been asked to me a lot in the last two weeks. So are you recovering from Thanksgiving, Pastor? And I said, it's like it didn't even happen. I mean, it's like it came and it went and suddenly we're right into Christmas just like that. And, you know, we don't want that to happen to Christmas. We want to make sure that we remember that we're coming to the Christ child. That we remember that we have the invitation to come to the manger, that we remember these stories that are so familiar and so very old are brand new only when we open our hearts, only when we open our minds, only when we open our spirits to them. And then, you know, when was the last time you got tired of breathing? I mean, never, right? I mean, never. You just take it for granted. You just assume that, oh, it's going to happen. And you, we don't even think about it. Now you're going to be thinking about it. Don't think about it. I mean, but we just take it for granted that it's going to happen, and it's the very breath of heaven. It's what gives you life. It's what gives you life every single day, and in the same way, for those of us who have received Christ Jesus, the celebration of his birth, we don't want to let it go by, but instead we want to acknowledge it and draw it in and hold it and let it out into the community around us. All of us know what it's like to have a pebble in our shoe. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know what it's like to be walking along, to be out on a run, to be on a hike, to be someplace in life, and suddenly think, doggone it, there's something in my shoe. And be walking along, and how big of a something in your shoe does it have to be to bother you? Oh, it can be the little teeniest, tiniest thing in your shoe, and suddenly... All of your body is bothering you, right? Suddenly your mind is bothering you. Suddenly every single step you take is hurting. Suddenly you're finding yourself on a curb. You're untying your shoe. You're sitting down. You're knocking the base of your shoe like that. You're putting your hand up in your shoe. You're feeling around in there. You can't find anything. You go, I must have gotten. You sit back down. You tie your shoe back on. You put it back on. You go for a walk, and it slides around in there. And suddenly, there it is again on the instep instead of on the heel or underneath the toes. And you're moving again. And you think, God, it, I didn't get rid of that thing. So you get down again, and this time you take out your insole. This time you do everything. You're really doing it, and you're certain you've got that stone out of your shoe. And you walk along, you can't feel a thing. And it feels so great, but what are you waiting for? That stone just to come out from wherever it's hiding so that it's back underneath your foot again and ruining that nice morning that you had out set aside just to have a walk. Now, you see, an awful lot of us, sadly, have lost so much of our anticipation that Christmas has become just a stone in our shoe. 
Oh man, I've got to take care of the shopping list. Oh man, I've got to get this done. Man, I've got to, I forgot my present for seeing Brace Kids. I can't believe it. Oh man, I've got to take care of a backpack. I still haven't gotten a backpack. And pretty soon it's one more obligation after the other. I can't believe it. I love having five grandchildren, but I've got to buy for five grandchildren now. Oh brother, the kids are so old, their presents are getting more expensive. How do I handle all this kind of stuff? I don't know what to get my wife this year for Christmas. I don't know what to get my husband this year for Christmas. She'll understand we went on vacation. God bless you, Debbie. Wasn't it a great Christmas present? You know, I mean, all of the things that we go through, and instead of it becoming an exciting adventure, which if you don't do any of that stuff, come Christmas Eve, it is going to be an exciting adventure. Even more exciting come Christmas morning if you don't do any of it. What we do is we let it be one stone in our shoe after the other. When you're a child, is it that way? Or when you're a child, is someone else taking care of all this stuff and you're just excited about it? Someone else is taking care of the shopping. Someone else is taking care of the food. Someone else went out and bought that pretty tree. Someone else came in and fixed it after you decorated it while you were asleep. They made sure all the decorations were on it right. Someone else wrapped the good presents on the tree. Someone else took care of it. And all you had to do was be excited because Christmas was coming and live in that anticipation of Christmas. Talking about the four words of Christmas, last week we talked about inspiration and how essential the inspiration that we're inspired and we let God in us at Christmas. And this morning I want to speak about that anticipation that we have for Christmas, not like a stone on our shoe that we're anticipating one more problem with every step we take, but the anticipation of a little kid who's excited to have the presence under the tree, the anticipation of getting together for the whole family, the anticipation of Christmas itself, of Christ born anew, Within us, probably one of the most famous texts in the entire Bible and least preached upon text of the Christmas story is called the Magnificat. Now, if you lived in the third world, or possibly if you grew up Roman Catholic, the man Magnificat would have been important to you. It's just called Mary's Song is what we would call it. It's Mary's Song. It's where she magnifies the Lord. It's after she's already discovered that she's going to be the mother of Jesus. She goes and she gets to share with Elizabeth, who's so excited, her aunt, because Elizabeth, who was barren, is now with child. And Mary breaks forth in song, and that text is right here in your card. Now, the cool part about this is, remember, when this was put in the Bible, this was a song. And there are still people who sing this. Except today, it's sung to lots of different music. I mean, there's the really highfalutin classical version of it that some of you may be familiar with, that as we read this, you'll think, wait a second, I think I know that song. There's the hymnal version of it that some of you have sung at Christmas. There's the worship version of it that's different than both of those. There are lots of different versions of this, and I'm guessing culturally and linguistically in all the different languages, there are probably different versions of different tunes. But wouldn't it be cool if we had the tune that Mary sang it to? I mean, they didn't have, you know, cell phones, so it wasn't like Elizabeth said, oh, Mary, that's so awesome, stand back, do it again, I want to catch that. We don't have any clue the tune that Mary sang this to. We didn't even know if there was a tune to it. We don't know, she just broke forth into this song. How many of you break forth into song occasionally and make up your own tune and just go along? Way to go. I love it. My dad used to do it every morning. We were driving along this week, Debbie, and I've been playing Christmas music in the car, and my favorite Christmas music to listen to is Nat King Cole. I, and some of you know who that is, right? I love Nat King Cole, and one of the reasons I love Nat King Cole because when he sings, he sounds like he's not even trying. Have you ever noticed that? The guy just sounds like he's not... You even look at him on, on the old things, the old Nat King Cole show. He just stands there like he's not even trying. Yeah, chestnut roast. And this incredible vo song coming out, you know. This incredible voice. I mean, everybody else, they look like they're trying. But um, this week we were listening to some Nat King Cole station that I have on my playlist. And suddenly came out, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. 
everywhere we go. And I said, Debbie, who is that saying that? Check out the phone. She looked and said, Perry Como. And I said, honey, we're a part of a generation that are probably the last to even know who Perry Como is. Oh, no, honey, you know the millennials and stuff. They got really into Perry Como for a while. And, and then all, the, all these women started singing the background vocals on it. And I said, okay, so who are the women singing, honey? So it sounds like the Andrews sisters to me. And I'm thinking to myself, now we're really old. How many of you know who the Andrews sisters are? I mean, in the, boy, we are old. Look at us. Now, I guarantee you there wasn't any kind of millennial resurgence for the Andrews sisters. And here suddenly was, was the Andrews sisters singing the next verse and everything going on it. And I was just kind of thinking, this is so cool. I was beginning to feel a lot. I wanted to just break forth in song. But I sounded so terrible. I couldn't carry the tune with Barry Como. I couldn't keep the high notes along with the Andrews sisters. And, I, and when I read this for Mary, I'm not going to be able to do it the way Mary did it for you either. However, it's lovely, and it's in the heart of your text. It says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Let's, let's say that out loud together. My soul magnifies the Lord. Friends, go home with lipstick, that red Christmas lipstick, and write it on your mirror. My soul magnifies the Lord. So that when you look at yourself and you comb your hair in the morning and you're brushing your teeth, you're thinking to yourself, this Christmas, my soul magnifies the Lord. It doesn't mean like a magnifying glass. You're looking down closer. It means that you're making it bigger in every single way. My soul is just so full that it's just magnifying. The Lord is letting it out. In everything I say, in everything I do, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Is that true in your life today? Has he who is mighty done great things for you? Raise your hand if it's true. Has he who is mighty done great things for you? You know, we need to acknowledge it from time to time. Because how many of us focus on all of the other things? How many of us focus on the bad things, the negative things, the collection of stuff that could have gone better in 2018, instead of saying, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. And friends, if we were to keep a diary of all of the great things that God has done in 2018, there is no amount of devastation that could happen now until the end of the year that could wipe out the great things that have happened in 2018. He who is mighty has done great things for you and me, brothers and sisters. He who is mighty has touched us in wonderful ways. And like Mary, our souls need to magnify the Lord. We need to acknowledge that as we come to Christmas. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And, his, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. If you've got children and grandchildren, this is an important time to think, man, I really want to make sure that I raise my kids up in the Lord. I really want to make sure that my grandchildren are raised up in the Lord so that they fear him from generation, from generation. When it says they fear him, it doesn't, this is, I've been preaching for the last few months out of the, King James Version of the Bible, so you're getting a lot of these old words. This means that they have faith in him. They look to him. Not that they're afraid, but they're drawn to him. First and foremost, it says, and his mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You know anyone who boasts an awful lot and seems proud in the world? You know where that pride comes from? It says right here in the Bible, the imagination of their hearts. Friends, what do you have to be prideful about in this world before God? That much. Everything else is the imagination of your heart. Say, hey, wait a second, but I've worked hard for what I've got, Pastor Eric. 
Yeah, hardly nothing compared to what's going to happen in eternity. Hardly nothing compared to what's going to happen when we face Jesus face to face. Hardly nothing compared to what he did for us on the cross. Hardly nothing compared to the great gift and joy in his resurrection. Hardly nothing in the promise of his return and definitely hardly nothing when you think about one who had all the glory of heaven and all the wealth of heaven and thought it not robbery to leave the wealth of heaven and come and take on the form of a human and be born in a manger. You see, all that, it's just in the imagination of our hearts. It says he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away. And this is the reason this text is not preached on in Christmas very often. Because here in America, we like a prosperity preaching. Here in America, we like to tell people that, you know what, if you work a lot harder, God's going to love you a lot more and you're going to be a lot better off. Some of you have been to Africa with me and we've traveled in Kenya. But you want to meet some people who work really hard? I mean, work really hard. I mean, Ellen, on the trip that you guys came, did, did you carry the big 40-gallon things of water that they carried? They have these huge containers, and one of the things we like to do when people go on the trip is we give them these huge plastic things that they send the women out first thing in the morning before sunrise to walk 10 miles to get the water for the entire family for the day and bring it back, and they carry it on their heads. And it's a great thing that just when you're at the river to fill it with water and hand it to someone and say, here, let's see how far you can carry this for. Can you carry it for 10 miles? Try it on your head. Folks, if you got rich by working hard and that was the sole ingredient to it, Africa would be the wealthiest nation on the planet Earth or the wealthiest continent on the planet Earth. These folks are working hard. They're working really hard. And you know what? The whole gift of the scripture to us is this. That grace comes to us. As, do you get grace because you worked hard? Grace is a gift of God. What kind of gift? The unmerited. Do you remember what that means, unmerited? You did not work for this. This gift that comes here in the manger, you do not deserve it. This is unmerited. It's just because I love you. Who shouldn't be singing? I mean, who shouldn't have a song in their heart? I'm surprised Solomon couldn't just sing out loud right there. I'm even louder than he was even long, except he knows all the musical stuff that he's doing. But I mean, as you're going along, who shouldn't have a Magnificat within us? So it says anticipation of positive events fills us, first of all, when we open up the glorified God above all else. When we open up to glorify God above all else, when you wake up in the morning, are you thinking, first thing today, my thought is to glorify God? Not most of us. Not most of us. I'm thinking, first thing today, if I can just get this leg out of bed, if I can just get this, if I can just go over there. And Debbie says, Eric, have you grown one more time in this house? And I'm just thinking, if, I, if we just open up our hearts to glorify God above all else, my soul magnifies the Lord. When I was a kid, every Christmas at the church I grew up in in Long Beach, where my dad was the pastor, we had a birthday party for Jesus. And people always thought it was hilarious. They made fun of it because you're having a birthday party for Jesus? It's Christmas. Why would you have a birthday party for Jesus? And I, well, you know, because Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And so then my friends would say, oh, how old is he then? And stuff like that, you know, and they would make fun. Because my mom and dad always told me, invite all your friends to the birthday party for Jesus. And it was the Sunday night of the Christmas Sunday, the Sunday before Christmas each year. But they would do this cool thing. My mom had essentially come up with this whole idea as the pastor's wife. She put it on. We were told to invite everybody in the community. And she would go out and she'd buy these cute little boxes with Christmas decorations on a little string handle on the top. And then she would go out and she would buy about 20 or 30 pounds of hard Christmas candy. 
Any of you ever get hard Christmas candy when you're a kid? Do they still make that stuff? They still make it? The stuff that sticks together and all that kind of stuff? It's awful. I mean, I can't imagine it now as an adult. You think, oh, my crowns would be gone. And I remember many a Christmas Eve night losing a filling. I mean, but we loved it. We looked forward to it. She would stuff those little boxes with all that stuff. She'd put it together. She would bake a cake. And she would put it together, and all of us kids would fill the sanctuary. It did because my mom, we were all told to invite friends. And we would sing happy birthday to Jesus. We'd sing happy birthday to Jesus, and she would invite all the kids up to blow out the candles. And it was so much fun. Because my mom just took that role on to magnify the Lord. What are you doing in your life to magnify the Lord in your neighborhood? to magnify the Lord amongst the children around you, to magnify the Lord in your church. Now, how hard was it to come up with saying, I want to have a birthday party for Jesus? Now, most all of us have had a birthday party for someone before, haven't we? Most all of us have gone to a lot of work. Oh, man, he's going to be 40 this year. We better go to a lot of work. Oh, man, she's going to be 60 this year. We better go to a lot of work. Oh, man, some of us spent a lot of money on birthday parties, and we've gone to all kinds of events. And maybe never a birthday party for Jesus. That's what it means to magnify the Lord. You think, what can I do to glorify God? It says, your vision, or I'm sorry, second point, anticipation of positive events fills us when we see the gift, when we're blinded by our garbage. Now, when I say garbage here, I don't mean that your stuff is garbage. Your stuff is probably really cool. Your stuff has probably got labels on it, names and brands and all that kind of stuff. But in light of creation, in light of Christ Jesus, is it all kind of garbage? In light of anything that we put before Christ Jesus, anything that would stand between you and the manger, guarantee you, it's garbage. You don't want anything that's ever going to be a gap between you and your relationship with your Lord and Savior as we come to him. We want to make sure that we see the gift this Christmas, that the child in the manger is essential to us. It says, he who is mighty has done great things for who? For me. Let's just say for me out loud together. For me. Has he who is mighty done great things for you? I mean, can you go back across this year and think about that time you prayed for your kids and, wow, things started to turn around for your kids. Can you think about that accolade that one of your grandchildren that you used to worry about so much suddenly received this year, unexpectedly? Can you think about that person who, when you thought their health was at the end, and instead found healing? Can you think about that one who you never thought they would find Christ and then this year they passed away and they passed right into the hands of the Lord and received their eternal gift? He has done great things for me. And we have the opportunity to say, I don't want any of my garbage to ever stand in the way of God's gift to me. I want to make sure that everything that I have is laid down at his throne. You see, is it a bad thing for you to have cool stuff? No, nothing wrong with you having cool stuff. These backpacks, I love them. Whoever's filling these, oh, whoever's filling these backpacks, God bless you, whoever brought these ones in. Look, this one's got water, it's got a blanket. People are, it's gonna be so easy for this to be an object of fighting on the streets of Los Angeles. Because the way you think of a really nice home Someone who is homeless? This is not just going to be their home for months to come that they can put all of their personal possessions in and keep them safe, and they don't have to leave them anywhere under a bush or next to the freeway. This is also going to be filled with Christmas gifts. A jacket, a blanket, some water, maybe some candy in there, I don't know. I mean, all kinds of stuff is going to be in here for Christmas. What a beautiful gift that is. But the problem is it's going to be easy to take this mine. 
And I guarantee you, if you've never come to our Christmas party on the streets, it's Sunday night, December 23rd. You're invited to come with us. It's a night of full insanity. Ken will be right at the front of the line of the insanity, trying to keep everyone in order. And you'll see people fight over this as if it were a Porsche. You'll see, see people fight over this as if someone's given them a key to a Ferrari. And they'll argue over it because that is the one thing now that they can claim. Nobody thought about them at Christmas. You did. And they get to lay hold of that. We don't want that garbage to stand in the way of the gift. We want their vision to become clear when they can look inside to their own heart. Why? Because he who looks outside dreams. He who looks inside awakes. And for us, we want to be those who are awake. Third, anticipation of positive events fills us when we prepare to receive and put our pride behind us. When we prepare to receive and put our pride behind us. Tomorrow is my friend Steve Hoover's birthday. Steve Hoover, um, I don't know what Steve's going to be tomorrow, maybe 70, 68, right in that age bracket. He's going to be 70, so it is his 70th birthday tomorrow. That's what I thought. Steve and I have known each other for decades, decades, and I haven't seen Steve for a year and a half, maybe two years. He's been in a nursing home. He, Steve doesn't know me at all. Steve doesn't know his family. Steve's got Alzheimer's. Steve doesn't know Steve anymore. Steve barely knows to breathe anymore. Steve literally was so much better of a father than I ever was in so many ways, so much kinder of a man, so much better of a so in every single way. Steve just was kind, and he was kind and gentle and loving to my children in every way. And he taught my children a lesson that I had never gone out of the way to teach them. I had taught my children so, so many ways to be prideful, not deliberately and not on purpose, but you know that kind of pride that pushes away and doesn't take no. year or two, and so she would keep her little book in the office, and Steve would come by and say, hey, Julia, could you notarize this for me? And so she would notarize it for it. She'd get out her little book. She would do everything, and then he'd try to pay her, and she was supposed to make $15 per signature or whatever it was, you know, the charge on the whole deal. He'd try to pay her, and she'd say, Steve, what, I've known you since I was a little girl. I'm not going to charge you anything, Steve. And he would get out the right amount of cash. And I remember, it took two or three lessons. I'd hear it in the other office, and he would say the same thing. Julia, when someone puts money in your hands, there are only two words that you're supposed to say. What are those words? Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Those are the only two words you're supposed to say. Steve would say it. So whenever I see Steve's birthday pop up, it's on my personal calendar. Whenever birthday pop up, I think about the lessons he gave my children that I didn't. Things like, you know, remember just to say, thank you. And to take it. When I was in Europe with my brother-in-law, I thought about Steve. Because my brother-in-law, every single night, this last October, he tried to pay for dinner. It could be insanely expensive, or it could have just been a piece of pizza. And every night, he tried to pay for dinner. My brother-in-law makes a lot more money than I do. My brother-in-law has always made a lot more money than I do. He can cover it, but prideful here, you know, and I wanted to pay. I wanted to get out and put it on my credit card. And I'd say, Dan, Dan, let me pay. He looked at me, Eric, no big deal. You arranged the trip. You said, I want to do this. And I forgot that lesson of just saying what? Thank you. How many of us, as we come towards Christmas, we need to prepare to receive again? We need to prepare to put our pride behind us. It says he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Friends, whatever you're prideful over today, it's just the imagination of your hearts. That's it. There's nothing real to be prideful in. You have nothing to boast over. Just the imagination of your hearts. Whatever it is that you think you've done and you've accomplished that's so important, you're going to stand right next to everybody else before the throne room of God. And this world is just the imagination of our hearts. 
We need to learn to receive. It says Christmas is not a time nor a season, but a state of mind to cherish peace and goodwill, to be plenteous in mercy, is to have the real spirit of Christmas. Calvin Coolidge said that, our 30th president. Now that they go by numbers on presidents all the time, number 41, number, I was a history major. It's the only reason I know that kind of stuff. I couldn't believe I got it right when I was actually thinking about this the other day. Our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. But I think about that, he's not talking about ignoring Christ. I mean, Calvin Coolidge was a Christian, and, and in our culture at that time, it was just assumed that everybody was a Christian. But he's saying that spirit that we have now at Christmas, we need to keep that spirit. All the time, we need to hold on to that spirit so we don't lose it. What are you doing to keep the Christmas spirit in your life this year? Teresa, when's the caroling? Friday night, the 20th? Friday night, the 21st, what time? 5 o'clock here at the church. And it'll be dark at 5 o'clock already, right? And we'll have snacks. Chili dogs? Oh, look at that. I'll tell you. And there's going to be Jack with his tractor? So we'll, and then there's going to be a big cart behind it that we all get to sit in? Like a big wagon? Will there be straw or something in it to be messy? No. If someone brought some, could they put it in there? Yeah, um, so how many people can get in it? 30 people. 30 people. Now think about it. How many of you went caroling last year? Three of you. Okay, now think about it. All of you are invited to go caroling this year. But there's room for 30. And is there a sign-up sheet back there, Ken, or no? No sign-up sheet? Anyway, <laughs> there's no sign-up sheet. So what you can do today is you can put on your card, I want to be there caroling. Now, if you do that, what do you need to do on that night, the 21st? You need to be there because what you're doing is you're bumping someone else out of the way. So second service, you have the opportunity to get ahead of them because you woke up early. You know what to say about the early bird. Um, you have the opportunity to do it. But if you get to Christmas and you think, man, it just doesn't feel like Christmas to me this year. And you were invited to go Christmas caroling. You were invited to eat chili dogs with Teresa and Jack. You were invited to do it. Now, this isn't happening because Ken's so smart or pastor is so smart. This is happening just like my mom had a Christmas party for Jesus. Teresa's having a caroling party for Jesus and inviting the whole church. That's how many people it takes. It takes one person to say, I'll do this. Everybody's invited. And that's what it takes in your home and your heart to magnify the Lord. But we have to be ready to receive so that we can experience the spirit of Christmas. We need to be ready to say, me, me, I want to be there. I'm not going to miss. Many of you know that we have a little sailboat in Dana Point. Every year, they have the Christmas boat parade down in Dana Point. Never have we ever been in it all the years, eight years now that we've had our boat in the harbor, eight Christmases. We've never been in the, well, before that we were in Long Beach. We never were in the Christmas parade there either. In fact, this year, Debbie and I went out for dinner, we came back, we walked down for coffee, the line was too long, we said let's go to Pete's Coffee instead, which was two miles away. We walked down, we watched them driving the boats out, all decorated to start the parade, and we got in our car and we drove away, while the crowds of people were coming into the harbor. Now, is it my fault if I miss out on the parade? Or is it someone else's fault? My fault, right? Because I'm the one who chose, I looked at Debbie and said, Debbie, you know, once we drive off this island, there could be no getting back on it, honey. You sure you want to? I said, oh, I've seen that parade plenty of times. It couldn't be that much different. And how many, you know what, I've seen Christmas plenty of times. You know, been there, done that, Pastor. Hard for you to come up with something new this Christmas for me. Tell it to God. I mean, tell it to God. It's his son's birthday. I mean, tell it to God. I mean, it's your Savior's who was born for us. We have the opportunity to say, I long to receive that which you have for me this Christmas. My heart has become barren in some ways, Lord. I've neglected you. I've looked for everything else in this world, and I've taken pride in what I've accomplished. 
Lord Jesus, I need that gift. The fourth, anticipation of positive events fills us when we discover the upside-down love of God for people. When we discover the upside-down love of God for people. Who do you think has more followers on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook? The Kardashians or the caravan in Tijuana? The Kardashians. I want you to know that's the easiest answer. Um, how many of you can name at least one Kardashian? How many of you can name anybody in the caravan? No one. No one. They could all name the rulers. And in our world today, the Kardashians, they're rocking the world, right? Go on Instagram, go on Facebook, go on any of it, just check how many followers they have. Are they beautiful? I can't name any, Kim, I know Kim. There's another one with two syllables. I'm not sure about that one. Um, they're beautiful. Are they wealthy? Yeah. Are they talented? I've still not figured out what they do. I have no idea what they do other than be beautiful, attractive, and all that. I, I mean, do they do anything? I, I don't know. I really don't know if they do anything. I think maybe they're famous for being famous, right? Is that it? Is, what? They have a television show? It must be on cable. Oh, you don't have, okay, so either way. Now we know what Bobby does in the evenings. Hey, Tiva the Kardashians. I'm what? But... I, I still don't know what they do. I still don't know what they do, but I know they're insanely famous. I know they're insanely famous. How does the upside-down love of God work? Here it is right here, friends. Here's the verse. This is straight from the heart of God. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Are you feeling lowly this year? Are you feeling like you know what, this Christmas, it's just not Christmas for me. And instead of counting your blessings, you're counting the burdens, and the heartbreak. If that's you this year, upside down love of God puts you at the top of the pile. Upside down love of God is looking for you this year. Upside down love of God is saying, you're at the top of my heap. Man, your Christmas list is the most important one for me, and I have exactly what you need this year. And the upside down love of God embraces us, and we can discover it. When you have a stone in your shoe, how many steps does it hurt? Every other step. Right? It's just every other step. Right? It's every other step. I mean, it's just in one shoe, so it's every other step. But how many steps are you thinking about it? Every single step. Every single step. I mean, every single step you're thinking about it, even though you just have a stone in one shoe. You're thinking about it. Now imagine for a second, if you were to prepare for Christmas by finding something small just to put in your shoe, just in one of them, and say, you know what, every step I want to think about Jesus. And so with one step, you'd be thinking, oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> but the other one, you would be in anticipation of hurting. You would be anticipating, oh, man, that's going to hurt when that goes down. Oh, that's going to hurt when that goes down. You see, for us, we have the opportunity to be anticipation of what's coming. Anticipation of great joy anticipation of what's out ahead for us. I'm excited about Christmas this year. I'm excited about being here with you. I'm excited about going caroling. My name's on the list. I'm excited about making sure that we have the opportunity to be together. But most of all, I want my soul to magnify the Lord. I want my soul 
my heart, my actions, my spirit to be above my pride. And I want to be willing to receive this Christmas. I want to learn this Christmas to discover the Christ child anew and to follow him. Simple prayer at the bottom of your card. For your prayer for anticipation says this, I've lost my edge, forgive me. I need an angel to wake me. I want to look forward to Christmas and be excited to celebrate. My soul longs to magnify you, Lord. Help me. Thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Christmas. It seems like one step is Thanksgiving. celebrate the giving in the heart of the poverty of Los Angeles and that we not overlook the gift of what it means to open our heart our spirits to you Heavenly Father and to say thank you and to receive that which you have for us this Christmas and for our joy just to magnify you God that through everything else we would just lift up your name that our blessings would just radiate out to the community around us. Lord Jesus, for that one who's come burdened this morning, for that one who feels like 2018 has broken their spirit, 